say thank you for for doing this and being my first uh, first trial on the video podcast here through Zoom. Um, and for people that are just listening, I'm, I'm, we're going to record this as a an audio podcast like normal. But as we're recording it on Zoom, and we're going to have some some slides and some photos to share, my intent is to turn this into a YouTube video so people can uh, watch it and see some of the, the trees and the oak staves and the barrels and some of the different components that we're talking about during our, our discussion. So thank you for being here and um, just want to start out and talk about sort of our, our shared history. Back in 2004, Quinn and I worked together at Robert Mondavi Winery in Oakville in Napa Valley. Um, I think I, we must have said hi just in, in passing, but I really feel in retrospect that uh, the great wealth of knowledge that I missed out on in not talking to you. So I'm, I'm hoping to make up for that here. But um, could, can you start out, Quinn, talking a little bit about uh, your family's history in Cooperage and how you became to, to be a master Cooper, please? Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, I got my start uh, working with barrels uh, uh, at the age of about 13. Uh, I was hired by my dad um, to uh, assist him with um, uh, a project that he had going at the time for refurbishing um, used barrels. Um, and so that was my first introduction to, um, you know, using the Cooper's tools, the hammer and the hoop driver, um, taking barrels apart and putting them back together again, basically, as well as, as toasting them. Um, but my dad uh, got his start in the Cooper's business um, uh, long before that. He um, came uh, to it in a kind of a roundabout way. He uh, started out in the wine business working in the cellar at Robert Mondavi Winery in the late 60s, which um, turned out to be a pretty, uh, a pretty good place for someone like him to work. I mean, he'd always been, you know, interested in, in things like woodworking. And so he was really kind of drawn to all of the, the barrels that, uh, that uh, were in use at Mondavi at the time. And of course, that's um, one of the, uh, one of the things that, uh, the many things that Robert Mondavi is sort of known for in the industry is uh, being one of the first people to start importing barrels from France. So my dad um, kind of worked his way up to eventually uh, sort of managing the barrel room there at Oakville. Um, and he got to know a couple of the Coopers who were selling barrels to Mondavi. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess they recognized his kind of unique interest. And uh, so <clears throat> he worked out a... <clears throat> Kind of a special relationship with one of them was a man named Philippe Demtos, um, and uh, <clears throat> by the late seventies, my dad was going over to the Demtos Cooperage in France to uh, complete kind of an apprenticeship uh, as a cooper. So he would go over there for you know a month at a time, come home for a couple of weeks, go back over there uh, until you know his kind of his training was finished. And then um, around 79 or 80, he um, uh, became the first kind of general manager of the Demptos Napa Cooperage. So both Demptos and Nadalier um, were the first uh, French uh, Coopers to set up shop uh, in the Napa Valley. Nadalier, of course, in Calistoga, which is still there, and then Demptos in Napa uh, around the same time. And so, um, that was probably the first place I ever saw a wine barrel uh, was kind of walking through there as a really small kid. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I spent uh, my summer vacations growing up uh, doing things like refurbishing used barrels, building a lot of oak upright tanks for various cooperages uh, at different wineries throughout Napa and the central coast. Um, and then, um, my dad went on to start a cooperage of, uh, for the Fetzer family uh, up in Hopland right. in Mendocino County uh, in the early 90s. And uh, my, I have a brother who's just about a year younger than I am. And uh, my dad has a brother who uh, also worked at Demptos. And so the four of us kind of managed production at Mendocino Cooperage. Um, and uh, that was a great experience, you know, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, one of the most rewarding things about it was, you know, starting it from the ground up uh, with kind of, 
very kind of limited resources at first and kind of, um, you know, uh, improvising, you know, uh, processes and, and things. Um, and another really uh, uh, kind of rewarding uh, part of the experience was that um, we, my dad, I, I suppose, more or less discovered a particular part of the U.S. Um, that turned out to be a really great source for American oak for wine barrels. Um, and so that this is um, sort of southern uh, Minnesota. There was a stave mill in the southeastern part of the state at the time that had been producing uh, bourbon staves. But, um, you know, my dad kind of took a look at the map and, and saw, you know, that some of these same forests being sourced by this particular mill were on kind of the same line of latitude as some of the, uh, you know, the, the great forests of France. And uh, sort of intuitively, you know, he got interested in, in, in exploring it. And so he went out there and, and talked to these folks and um, ended up convincing them, you know, that there was a future in the wine, in wine stave production for them. And um, that turned out to be kind of the bread and butter of that whole operation for many years was this Minnesota oak um, a barrel, primarily first for Fetzer. You know, we, we started as the in-house cooperage for them. And then uh, when the Brown Foreman Corporation bought Fetzer, they built a brand new modern, you know, uh, high-tech cooperage and production really expanded. And we started to move into, you know, more like European oak, French oak and, and, and Eastern European oak barrels and so on. But um, yeah, that was a real special time, I think, because it really opened a lot of people's eyes to you know, the potential for quality for, for American oak. And, um, you know, we had, um, we had developed some, some good relationships and some loyal customers, but, uh, um, by about, uh, 99 or 2000, we moved on to, um, <clears throat> treasury wine estates. So that was at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, known as Behringer Blast, which became Foster's, which became treasury. But, um, the, the, the model was kind of similar to what we had done at Brown Foreman, where uh, it was the, 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 the in-house cooperage, the internal source uh, for, in, in, in this case, it turned into more, um, our, uh, much more of a French oak cooperage than an American oak cooperage. So that was when I really first got exposed to, or you know, uh, started to learn more about French oak uh, and to travel more often to France and to get to know suppliers over there. And, so we were at the peak producing around 20,000 barrels a year. And, um, you know, for, for, for brands like Behringer and uh, Chateau St. Jean and uh, Etude and uh, uh, all the other Stagsley Winery and, and the other uh, treasury brands. Um, now, was that California. under the brand Roberts and Sons? What, what were those barrels so, Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, um, we, in addition to a winemaker's cooperage was the name of the, okay. of the, of the in-house uh, operation. And then we sold barrels outside of, of treasury under the Robertson Sons brand. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I think it was 2008 or nine. Uh, we moved on and um, I uh, ended up, hearing about this opportunity. I worked for a year as a cellar master at a little winery in Napa called Bukela. And then, oh, I didn't uh, know that. yeah, the cellar master. So in the cellar, doing work. Yeah, doing yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, it's such a small operation. It's basically a th team of three people. Uh, but Rebecca Weinberg was the winemaker there at the time. Sure. Um, really. She's been on the podcast. I like Rebecca. Oh uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's so few opportunities, you know, in, in the cooperage business that I wasn't sure, you know, when, you know, I was going to, you know, if ever I was going to uh, go back to making barrels. But then, you know, Tonellery O gave me a call in uh, 2012. And, uh, of course, that uh, Tonellery O is owned by uh, Cork Supply, uh, which has been in the, the cork business in California since the, in the early 80s. But um, they built a cooperage in 2009 and um you know really invested in top of the line uh, equipment um it's a beautiful facility uh you know it was really uh, unlike anything i'd ever kind of seen or, or worked with before so it was a pretty easy decision to to come to work there so it's yeah it's going on 
it's a little over eight years now that I've been uh, the master cooper there. So, and um, tell me about what your team, uh, not not all of course supply, but your team that is specific to, to barrels and cooperage, and maybe even some of the oak alternatives. What does that look like now at Tenorio? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're making about between nine and ten thousand barrels a year. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're about say sixty percent French oak, forty percent American oak barrels. Um, We've got a team of about uh, 13 guys in the shop. Uh, we operate uh, a little bit differently from uh, some of the other uh, local cooperages in that we're one of the operations where we're processing all of the wood in-house. Um, so in other words, like we, what we receive is referred to as like blank staves. So it looks like lumber and then um, we've got um, a couple of machines that will turn that into, you know, plain jointed material for barrel construction. So, um, you know, the, the other model is to have kind of a third party do that, you know, to own your own mill. Um, and the raw material uh, is milled and you basically create sets of staves and heads that uh, are then shipped to the cooperage for assembly and toasting and, and, and so on. So um, we're kind of a, you know, a, um, a start to finish operation. Um, and then the, as far as the alternatives, yeah, we, we've uh, uh, seen that business grow uh, pretty remarkably uh, since I've been there. Um, and, you know, we're producing, uh, French and American oak alternatives, um, both fire toasted as well as uh, convection toasted products. Everything that we make is based on staves. So we don't make, um, you know, balls or beans or mm -hmm. cubes or any of that, uh, those type of products. Um, but, uh, you know, tank, uh, tank fans, tank inserts, barrel inserts, you know, the full kind of complement of uh, alternative products. As okay. Well. So, Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. So mm -hmm. kind of what I'd like to do is, is follow the wood. So I'd like to you know, start in forest and go through the entire process of, uh, from, from trees to, to a finished barrel. But what I'm hoping you can do along the way is point out all of the sort of quality metrics along the way. Like what are the important things to, to, to focus on with that knowledge that ultimately you're trying to build a, a barrel for to, to, to house wine? Um, mm -hmm. And to have you know to bring positive characteristics to, to that wine. So uh, does that sound cool? If we kind of start some of these photos and then walk through it that way. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so we should give me a second here to pull up some photos. But um, okay, so here we are. We're looking at uh, at a forest, and uh, I'm going to assume that we're we're looking at a forest in France because I know that they so actively manage their forest. But can you sort of take it from here and tell us what uh, what we need to be thinking about to start with the trees? Sure, absolutely. So um, we work with four different suppliers, four stave mills in France. Um, they are all uh, sort of concentrated within about a two hour radius of Paris. Uh, and that's not by accident. You know, that's uh, where many, if not most of, um, you know, the, the, the most kind of renowned um, forests or sources of oak are located. So these guys all basically operate in the shadow of, you know, some of these, um, of, of the forests that they, that they source. Uh, so it's very interesting, you know, uh, what I've come to kind of learn about, um, you know, the way that, uh, the way that uh, the oak supply chain works in France and that first off, uh, virtually all of the oak that's harvested for barrel production in France comes off of uh, public land. So uh, it's forest that's either owned by, uh, uh, it's either the property of a village or it's the property of the French national government. And so uh, the, in the difference is, uh, you know, the French word for, one of the French words for a village is commune. So you have the forêt communale. Uh, and that makes up about 15% of all the 
the surface area of forest in France. And then you have the Forêt d'Omagnal, which is the national forest. And that only makes up about 10%. So 25% uh, is public land. Um, but what distinguishes these um, publicly owned forests is the, the degree of forestry management or silviculture that takes place there. So um, these are trees that have been sort of managed or even like cultivated um, both to, uh, both to um, ensure, you know, like a continuous supply and also to maximize the quality of the timber that the trees will produce. So, and Quinn, can I uh, jump in real quick and just ask you? Yeah. I know that you know wood. Wood has had um, seen you know has other uses before. You know, oak was so so important for wine barrels. Was it like the the French Navy or, or certain other specific industries that were that are really concentrating on managing these forests? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, there uh, the French Navy was you know this. Um, uh, uh, the, there was a military use for a lot of this timber, um, mm -hmm. specifically for, you know, they wanted big straight trees to, to make things like masts and keels for big boats. Uh, so the French national government was very interested in the preservation of, and, you know, cultivation of, big, tall, straight trees, you know, for these big construction projects. Um, and then uh, at the, even at the local level, you know, oak uh, and, uh, was a really important source of, of energy, of fuel for, you know, for heat, you know, for various applications, right? Not only for heating homes, but for things like, you know, heating forges, you know, for um, forging uh, steel. Um, so, uh, yeah, variety, you know, and, and then in addition to things like, um, you know, uh, building construction, uh, and then, you know, even today, things like, um, uh, making what they call sleepers, you know, the, the railway ties that go under the rails, um, on a railroad, those are in constant need of, you know, replacement and everything. So, um, you know, those you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, is still, um, another big, um, another big, uh, use for, for, for this oak. Okay. Thank you. So obviously, you know, the military progresses, boats aren't made out of wood anymore. There's at some point there's a, a shift to, to other uses, including winemaking. Right. Right. And even before, you know, I mean, barrels, uh, would have been used to ship to ship, you know, all kinds of dry goods, you know, food, liquid of, of all kinds, you know, right, right up until, you know, the 20th century. So, uh, yeah, big, big uh, part of, of world, uh, you know, uh, commerce and transportation. So, so when uh, in the oak forest, are they um, specifically trying to grow only oak or is it, uh, are they, they managing like in a whole ecology of other, other species as well? I imagine monoculture is going to get them into trouble. So they probably try right. to avoid that. Right, exactly. Yeah. And there are uh, typically, yeah, it, it's, there's uh, a kind of uh, diversity of species found in, in these forests. Uh, you know, there'll be several species that tend to dominate. Usually um, you'll see a lot of, of, oak and uh, beech growing together okay and then you also see, see uh, a lot of birch uh, you'll see uh, large hornbeam um, and even from you know in uh, certain forests uh, you'll see a mixture of like conifers with some of these hardwoods um, but uh, yeah definitely you you never encounter a forest that's like entirely an oak forest right Okay. Um, yeah, and each species has its own kind of application, um, and even you know part of the this um, system of silviculture involves, and I can get into a little more detail uh, in a minute. But um, you know, very often you'll see, you know, uh, a, a big straight oak uh, that is flanked by 
kind of smaller, uh, say, beech trees. And, you know, it's, there, there's a strategy behind that and that they're leaving these beech trees to provide or to, to create competition with the oak for light up in the forest canopy. So mm -hmm. uh, this is, a, um, this is a, a significant reason why you see so many straight trunks in this picture, for example, and so few low-lying branches is that the trees are spaced close enough together that each one is trying to outgrow the, the trees surrounding it. Um, so it forces it into this very specific, this straight, uh, tall uh, shape. So. Okay. And um, what, what kind of age of trees are, are we looking at here? And how long is the, in general, going to take for an oak to, to start from, from seedling to something you'd consider harvesting for? Mm -hmm. It all depends on the, the diameter of the trunk. So, uh, you know, typically they, uh, they won't look at harvesting a tree or consider harvesting a tree until the diameter reaches a minimum of about 45 centimeters. So about a foot and a half at the very minimum. Um, and it, in France, depending on things like the species, um, the, you know, the, the, the climate, the amount of rainfall, the soil type, you know, uh, if you have conditions that favor more rapid growth, you know, then a younger tree will reach that size, you know, uh, or a tree will reach that size at a younger age. Uh, if the conditions are reversed and, you know, uh, the trees are more slowly growing, then it might take a little bit longer. But typically the trees are about 120 to 140 years old before they attain that, that minimum required, uh, you know, giant girth. So, uh, and it's really, you still see, forests full of trees in France that are easily, you know, two, three feet in diameter or, or, or sometimes even more. So those are trees that, you know, are, are, are probably around 200 plus uh, years old. So is there any advantage to, to leaving a tree to, to grow older and, and larger? Well, I think, you know, it's a good question. I mean, you, you know, if, if you, if, if you, cut the trees down too small, uh, you won't be able to produce uh, enough staves to, you know, to, to, to cover the costs of extracting it from the forest and milling it and so on. So, um, but, uh, you know, so yeah, that's why they established this kind of minimum uh, size for the tree. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, bigger isn't always necessarily better though. Uh, especially I know like sometimes the, the really big trees, they can be really impressive while they're standing, but when you cut them down, you know, there's a big cavity in the center of decay, you know, where the, mm -hmm. it's beginning to, to, to die. <laughs> so I think that, yeah, typically, you know, you see like that 150 to 200 years seems to be kind of the sweet spot um, for, for harvesting. Okay, now it's been a while since I've taken any of my plant physiology courses, but I know yeah. for, for trees, vascular cambium, which is the living tissue of the tree, is on the, the outside. It's underneath the bark. Uh, so the tree right. is growing from sort of the, the out, out, outer diameter every year, right. correct? Okay. Correct, correct. Yeah, so what happens is, you know, at in the beginning of the tree's life, you know, it's referred to as a sapling because, you know, it's... Uh, it's made up of entirely of, of sap conducting tissue, right? Okay. Sap wood. Oh, that makes sense. And, yeah. And then as the tree ages, uh, after about say 10 or 15 years of its, uh, life, then it begins to, um, sap wood begins to sort of die back and create, uh, something different called heartwood. Mm -hmm. So, in these really old trees, if, when you cut them down and you look at the, at the end of the log, you know, you, you see the bark on the, the outside, you see kind of a relatively thin layer of yellow or bright white uh, wood that is the sap, sap wood. So that's the part of the tree that was living when it was, when it was cut. And then uh, everything inside of that is, is referred to as the heartwood. So the heartwood is the only part of the, 
the tree that can be used uh, to, to build anything really, and especially for barrels. Um, uh, it's, it's less porous than the sapwood. So from a, like a mechanical you know, structural point of view, it's more, uh, it's, it's more resistant to, to leaking. Uh, and then it doesn't, you know, from a sensory point of view for barrels in particular, it doesn't have the, the resinous, you know, uh, aromatic right. character of the sap. So. Right. And that would be, that could be very problematic to winemaking. Refer exactly. to wine. Right. Exactly. So in, yeah. in, in this photo that I have here, the, the, the wood on the left is French, the one on the right is American, but is it correct that the, the darker wood is the heartwood and that sort of lighter yellowish beige outer part, is that the, the green wood? It, it could be. I mean, there is, there is natural kind of variation in color, especially okay. with uh, American oak, you can have heartwood that, that, the, that has a, kind of a paler color. And um, but you, know, you know sapwood when you see it. It's, it's like sort of uh, this, the sort of stark white color. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, and then so um, yeah, as I mentioned, so the the heart the heartwood is is the only part of the the tree that will become a barrel stave. Um, and then there's um, and I, I mentioned the heartwood is is less porous than the sapwood, but uh, there are um, physical differences between different oak species um that um affect its porosity and so different methods have to be used to mill staves from logs depending on the species that you're that you're working with so okay um that's why people talk about the difference between splitting and sawing oak um for example so um you know, you've got in this picture you've got the american oak you've got the the french oak uh, one of the major differences um, between the two physically is that uh, the heartwood of the Quercus alba, which is the, the white oak that's harvested for, for barrels in the United States, um, is much denser. Uh, the, those, all those um, sap-bearing vessels in the, that were open in the sapwood become... Uh, occluded or pinched or blocked off when the sapwood becomes heartwood there's mm -hmm. a little clot basically that forms in the vessel called a tylose and um american oak quercus alba is very rich in the heartwood is very rich in these tyloses and so that makes it much denser wood french oak is it, it you know tylosis this process occurs in french oak as well but but um to not to the same degree so more of these pores remain open in the French oak species. Um, and so the um, French stave makers have to be really careful about the way that they, um, the way that they render staves from, from the logs. Um, so there's, if you look at the, the end of a, of a log, you see obviously the concentric, like the annual rings, mm -hmm. but then perpendicular to those rings, you see these straight lines that radiate from the center of the log out to the edge. And um, those are called rays. They're called medullary rays. So um, French stave makers um, pay very close attention to the position of those rays. The ray is, it's what they call multiseriate tissue. So it's basically, it's non-porous. It's layers of tissue that are kind of stacked next to each other. So it's impermeable tissue. Um, it's also a point of where the wood is easy to kind of cleave apart. So if you look at like the ancient history of barrel making, you know, in a large respect, it's due to the fact that you can take a, a huge, like two or 300 year old tree and split it, split the logs by hand. You know, if, if you follow the direction of the medullary ray, um, you can split a, a, a big log open, uh, you know, with, with relatively little effort. But 
So what they're doing, not only is it facilitate the splitting of the log itself, but when you split along the medullary rays, what you're hoping to do in the end is to create a stave where all of those rays remain parallel to the length and the width of each stave. So okay, it's like a, sense. yeah, it's like a sheet sort of of tissue running along the length of the stave that's going to, um, that's going to basically form a barrier for the passage of liquid from one face through, through the piece. So, um, uh, American oak, because of its density, you know, they don't have to really uh, rely on the medullary rays in the same way the French oak uh, stave mills do. And so they can be much more efficient in producing staves. And they, so all of the staves for American oak barrels are quarter sawn. So there is no axes involved in an American oak stave mill. It's all saws. And um, they're cutting each log into quarters. And then they're cutting the flat sides of each of those quarters to make the staves and uh, they can do it you know uh they can produce uh, a lot more staves from a log the same size um because so of one, one of the reasons that american oak is is cheaper than in french oak there's many reasons but one is because you can get you can more barrels per tree from american oak right correct correct absolutely like the yield you know it's you know the rule of thumb for french oak is that uh, for every log that you cut, even if it's a, you know, a, a, from a perfect tree, you know, that is straight and, uh, you know, it's free of defects, uh, to make high quality barrel staves, you can only use about 20% of that log. Wow. So, yeah. And with, with American oak, it's probably more than double that. So, okay. um, Big deal. Because of the, the difference between the splitting and the sawing and following the medullary rays. So, I mean, if, if it, more and more you see in stave mills in France, you know, if they have perfect logs, you know, the, the technology is improved now where they can use saws with so much precision that they, they can take like their, their very highest quality logs and saw them to get a little bit more, you know, a few more staves out of them. Um, but, you know, generally, they're forced to do all this because if they if they don't split the staves the way I described and you wind up with the medullary rays um, uh, running off at an angle to the stave, then that just mm -hmm. becomes a pathway for liquid. And oh, okay. it's yeah, it's um, it, you won't be able to make a watertight container. So okay. So I kind of jumped ahead with this photo. I'm going to go back to some of the pictures of the, the trees here, but maybe we can talk about this here because I think, um, is this, this is, is this correct? This is the height of the tree where you would evaluate it in the forest, sort of a couple meters off the ground? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, walking through the forest, um, this is uh, obviously, this picture was taken in the winter time. There's no uh, leaves up there, um, but uh, the trees will be evaluated um, so that the, the season for harvesting is from fall to the say end of winter, very beginning of spring. Uh, they wanna cut the trees down uh, while the tree is dormant. So mm -hmm. if, um, if they cut the tree while the sap is still rising in the tree, uh, for, for stave makers in particular, it can be, or for winemakers, I suppose, ultimately it's problematic because uh, there's a danger that, that the presence of the sap will be, you know, noticeable in the, in the, in the, in the sensory properties of the wood. You'll smell it, you know, so. Do you think that's because in the, the toasting process that's going to get, um, caramelized or, or potentially burnt? Is that the issue? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's something that, it hasn't really been thoroughly explained to me, you know, <laughs> okay. um, you know, why they still do it this way, because obviously we're not using the sap anyway. So, right. you know, why that would permeate the tree at a certain time of the year, why would that would make a difference, you know, but they, they even, in addition to harvesting, you know, only during certain months, I mean, they, they also pay attention to like the lunar cycle. So, mm. um, you know, uh, they want to, 
cut the trees when, you know, basically like at low tide, you know, um, when the moon's gravitational pull is at its lowest point, you know, so again, it's and that's not- And potentially there's less sap up, up in the wood itself correct, in the trees? Correct, correct. So the, they, they call it, they say, you know, the, they, we only cut when the moon is down. So ah. um, moon is down, winter time, but yeah, so, but then, um, on public land, you know, there's a, a, a big um, agency in the French government called the ONF, the uh, National Office of Forests, and they um, employ thousands and thousands of people to, for the management of all this public land. And one of the things that certain employees uh, of the ONF are responsible for is um, going out and Basically, it's like they take a census in every forest. You know, the forests are divided up into parcels that are very thoroughly mapped and everything. And so the ONF is constantly checking on the progress of, of all these trees. And they're, um, it's really exhaustive. You know, they look at every tree in the parcel by species. They take um, every species, every, you know, every beech tree in that parcel and they uh, measure the size of the tree. Uh, they're they're really interested based in in tracking the growth of the trees because it's a metric that they'll use, you know, to calculate how much wood can be harvested every year, mm -hmm. you know, um, to avoid overforesting. Right. Um, and uh, so they basically are are making uh, an estimation of the volume of timber that's present in all these standing trees in every parcel of every uh, publicly owned forest. And then, so in addition to that, then you have the, the prospective uh, buyers, the people who wanna purchase these trees, uh, who are, are out in the same parcels and they're making the same kind of measurements um, and they're also uh, evaluating the overall, what they kind of, think of the overall health and quality of the tree. And there's all these clues, you know, in the tree's appearance that tell you, give you an idea anyway, of like what the wood on the inside is like, you know. Um, obviously they're looking at like the straightness of the tree is pretty easy to determine. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a tree that's kind of twisted or crooked, uh, it's certainly not gonna have much value to a cooper um, because it's gonna be very difficult to, to take a log in that shape and bend it into a barrel without breaking it, you know, so that kind of stuff. And then, you know, looking for like a long clear trunk, which is to say one that doesn't have a lot of little branches sticking out of it. Uh, branches are the source of knots in the wood. So you want knot free timber. Um, you can even see uh, evidence of like, you know, in, in a year where there was a really bad, uh, freeze, you know, and the trees froze, the water in the tree turns to ice and it can open up a big crack inside the tree. So those type of things are going to, you know, those type of defects will, uh, will uh, reduce the amount of, uh, you know, usable timber inside the tree. Uh, they can even do things like take a core sample, you know, they, they'll take a huge drill bit and drill into the base of the trunk of the tree. This, this they do in the, in the summertime. Uh, and they basically sort of tap the tree. And when you take the drill out, water flows out of that hole. And you can judge something about the health of the tree by the color of that water. You know, if it's, oh, if really? it's clean and clear, then, you know, tree's probably in good shape. But if it's brown or orange, or, you know, it could have some kind of, uh, fungus growing in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's another uh, thing that happens with trees over time called shake, where uh, trees that are blowing back and forth in strong winds, uh, cracks can open up along the annual rings inside the trunk of the tree, and they create these cavities where water collects. And so the water will change color so that, you know, they can tell maybe there's a problem with shake in this tree. There's too many cracks in it. So it might not be you know, uh, the best tree to try to make a barrel from. But what it's are the, uh, what are like the secondary uses for some of these, these trees that don't make a cut for, for cooperage for wine? 
Yeah. So things like the railway sleepers, uh, uh -huh. you know, yeah, different kind of grades of construction or utility lumber. Um, they make, yeah, I've seen, uh, you can make pallets out of oak, um, all oak alternatives, um, you know, as long as the oak is healthy, you know, but the, yeah. uh, they, they don't want to use obviously uh, something that's diseased for that. But, uh, you know, if twisting or knots doesn't really matter all that much, um, especially twisting is, is inconsequential for alternatives. So uh, those kinds of things. But it's interesting because they, they use the same word in French for the cutting down of the, these trees as they do for like slaughtering a cow. <laughs> and it's really uh, they abat. Uh, so it's uh, and it's fitting because that's how they look at these trees. Like there's all these different cuts. You know, uh -huh. there's the there's the fillet and there's the you know there's the rump roast or whatever. So right. yeah, I mean the highest quality I guess would be uh, today would be barrels, but also like things like for veneer for furniture. That has mm -hmm. you have to have like a really flawless tree to make to make veneer, um, so that's the part of the tree that you know that uh, is going to get the highest or you know that has the highest value. But that's what they do. They'll they'll take it you know in these kind of when they're standing at the foot of the tree, they'll kind of look up and say, all right, well these two meters here from the ground up look pretty good, but there's some twisting up there. There's some knots. You know maybe that second couple meters is sleepers or you know um, or uh, lumber or something and then I mean there's a use for everything even the branches you know a lot of people still burn wood in France for heating so you know uh, they'll leave that stuff in the forest but um, the it's definitely I would say there are very very few trees out there where the entire trunk of the tree is like cooperage grade would so okay okay so uh in the season the winter season these trees get cut they get uh hauled to a, a, a stave mill right is mm -hmm. that the next step correct and then, yeah uh, do they pretty quickly get um milled into to staves to season well it depends they everybody keeps staves in inventory um you know, uh, usually people have about a year's worth of inventory uh, on their property at the mill. Um, so you can, you know, you can keep logs. The wood doesn't really start to season until the logs are opened up and turned into staves. Um, one thing that they, that they have to do uh, to wood in inventory, to logs in inventory, is uh, spray them with water to, uh, to prevent infestation by insects. So if you go to a stave mill in the summertime, you see um, uh, these you know, huge, huge piles of stacks of logs and they're being sprayed on these giant sprinklers to, to, to preserve them. Um, so it's not necessary you know, to, 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 to process the log immediately. Uh, and okay. it's, a good, it's good to have wood logs in inventory too because it's often the case that like, you know, you cut the tree um, and, you know, you might not be able to haul the tree uh, on that same day. Um, one of the other reasons why uh, winter is the best season to, to, to do all this harvesting is that, you know, in the old days, they used to make staves in the forest. You know, they didn't have any oh, wow. means of conveyance that was big enough to get a law, you know, a big tree trunk, you know, yeah, I mean, transported. So, yeah, exactly. So the guys would cut the tree down and then they'd cut the tree into the logs. And then with all these hand tools, they would just like, you know, pitch a tent out there and uh, start cutting the logs into staves. And then somebody would come with like a horse drawn wagon and they'd take the staves in these batches or whatever. So anyway, but you know, now with these big trucks and everything, uh, uh, they, they, they want to haul logs in the winter because the ground is frozen. So right, um, right. they won't let the trucks into the forest. They're too big and heavy uh, when it's muddy out there. So mm -hmm. um, it's good to have, anyway, long, long way of answering your question. But uh, 
it's good to have logs in inventory in cases where like say in the spring if and this is happening more and more you know with climate change we're hearing this from our suppliers it's like oh we cut these trees like a month ago but then it's been raining nonstop and we can't get the logs in you know so uh they have to rely on the logs they have in stock to see them through until the the ground dries out and they can go back in there okay okay so um tree comes in gets uh milled to some degree and then is it, is it quick when it is milled gets milled into these staves which we see on the screens that then get stacked in these sort of ladder lattice patterns to let air flow through and water flow flow through exactly right so uh typically the way it works is that yeah the the wood is palletized so the the staves are milled and they're split and shaped and everything into these boards or staves and the staves are uh, given a kind of quality check at the same time and everything that that passes you know muster goes onto a pallet and they'll usually lay down two staves on either edge of the pallet and then they'll uh, lay put a layer of you know say 10 or 12 staves uh, perpendicular to those two that um, covers the the pallet from from front to back and then repeat that uh, and they always, they're, they're not only leaving space between the layers, but within the layer, there's space between each individual stave. Mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly. The reason is that, you know, uh, mainly that they, they want to dry the wood. So they need to have airflow through that stack. Um, but at the same time, you know, they, they want the wood to be kind of intermittently rinsed by rainfall. Um, and that has the kind of the the, the beneficial effect of uh, of uh, leaching some of the tannin from the wood, uh, and then they want you know the sun and the wind to be able to penetrate as as much as possible through that stack to to dry it out. So okay, um, so if, if I understand it, there's you have your your abiotic factors, right? Your rain and your sun and the wind. But also there's some, I imagine there's got to be some, some fungus that grows naturally on these stairs. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, uh, apparently, you know, there's been some research done that indicates that, yeah, there's, uh, you know, kind of a, um, this, uh, you know, biofilm that grows on the surface of the stave, different kinds of, uh, you know, fungi that colonize the, the, the wood and that can help liberate, you know, some of these aromatic compounds uh, right. and really, really um, change the sensory properties of the wood, you know, make it less planky, you know, less overtly kind of woody, uh, mm -hmm. less vegetal, uh, and uh, more, you know, brings out more sort of sweetness and that kind of vanilla character from the wood. I mean, it makes sense where there's substrate, and in this case, it's, you know, sugar water sap from the tree, you're going to have mm -hmm. uh, biology taking advantage of that, that carbohydrate source. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you, it's, it's really remarkable to see how the, the appearance of the wood changes over time. And this is like a minimum two-year process. So the wood is outdoors. Um, you know, uh, some people intervene. You know, they're, they're you know, uh, you can sprinkle the wood with water. Um, and I think that's usually or in a, an attempt to kind of speed up the process a little bit, or maybe, you know, to, to, to really dramatically try to leach the tannin out. But uh, otherwise, in most cases, at least in, in, in our case, with all of our suppliers, the wood is like untouched for, for a couple of years. Uh, and over that time, you know, you can definitely get a sense that, yeah, there's something, there's something living on this, in this stuff. Yeah. Right, so growing here. So. so, Quinn, when in the process, like for for Tunnelry O, when do they take ownership of the wood? Mm. When is it yours? Yeah. So, or, we're, uh, yeah, typically we finance uh, the our purchases for wood over three years. So we we pay the supplier a certain percentage when they cut the staves. We then we pay them a certain percentage after the first year of seasoning, and, and so on. And then uh, it's only uh, after those payments have have, uh, have been made that that you know it's it's truly our wood. Um, and then typically 
this is something that is easy to forget. You know, and I sometimes forget it actually that, you know, we, we go over there every year to visit our suppliers and make these purchases and we're always buying wood. I mean, there is kind of a spot market, but most years it's not real big. You know, it's, it's, it's usually, it's not that easy to find significant quantities of seasoned wood that you can just buy and ship, you know? Okay. So we're always buying wood. You know, we have to forecast, you know, three years into the future and see how many barrels we think we're going to be selling. And then we, we use, we base our purchasing on, 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 on that number every year. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so at the, at the end of the seasoning, then we uh, take delivery. The wood has to be restacked from that configuration in the picture to something much tighter, you know, to, to get as much wood in the shipping container as possible. Mm -hmm. And then uh, typically there's about there 25 cubic meters of the staves for the barrels and then the shorter lengths that's called heading for the barrel heads uh, goes into a container and is delivered to the Cooperage in Venetia. So Quinn, let me, let me phrase the question a little bit. When do you begin to be involved with ownership of the wood? Is it as a tree standing in the forest or after it's felled and brought to after the mill? It's, after it's felled, when, when okay. they cut staves. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. So we, we, the way it, uh, we rely on our suppliers to purchase the trees and you know, that we, we can go to, you know, we can be present when these purchases take place. It's, you know, unfortunately it's, it's impractical for us to be at every single one, but you know, uh, most, most years I'll go uh, to at least one or two of these. Um, and that's an interesting topic in itself, you know, is the way that the wood gets sold um, uh, in these national forests where, um, most of the time, uh, our suppliers are buying standing trees. So they're, as I said, they've been out there making these estimations and um, then they will, uh, uh, they'll get a catalog each year from the ONF with everybody else who's a prospective buyer of uh, all of the parcels in these public forests that are going to be sold that year and they can use this catalog it has a map of the parcel it has all this information that they've gathered regarding you know the, the number of trees by species the size of the trees the their estimate of the volume of timber and then they'll go out make their estimation and then they'll take all of these calculations that they make to uh an auction uh, which is typically held like toward the end of summer, beginning of fall. And um, it's administered by the ONF, you know, and uh, you have a room full, a hall full of people sitting at tables and you've got people up on a stage with a map of the parcel behind them. And they, you know, announce the name of the parcel. And um, everyone has a little handheld electronic device that they use to enter their bid. And they're given usually around 20 seconds to, to do that. And then uh, the winning bid flashes on the screen with the name of the bidder. And usually they'll also have the second place uh, bidder up there as well. Um, and there's a sort of a reserve price that the ONF keeps mm -hmm. secret uh, that has to be met. But otherwise, um, that's typically how, how the purchases are made by the suppliers. Um, I imagine that uh, leads to some entertainment. So that that silent bidding. It, yeah, it's pretty. It's 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 pretty intense. You know. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, people running outside for a smoke, like <laughs> in between <laughs> in between bids. <laughs> so is it correct so, that 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 broker will buy the wood from that entire parcel in in a bid? Yes. Yeah. So okay. that's yeah. So it's that's a good question. It's like you know, mo the. You know, there's all kinds of sawmills in France, of course, uh, and some of them specialize in hardwood, some of them specialize in softwood. You know, some people are just making barrel staves, some people make barrel staves along with other, you know, sawn material for like flooring and stuff like that. So, you know, depending on the parcel and, and what kind of trees are there and so on, you know, you've got a variety of people 
bidding on it for, for different kind of purposes, applications or whatever. But so then, yeah, they buy, they buy everything that's for sale in that parcel. And okay. then whatever they don't want or need, you know, they're, they're, it's, I think it's usually there's certain specific trees that they're really after and they're willing to take on these other, you know, to uh, purchase these other trees and then they can, they can sell off the stuff that they're not going to use. But um, yeah. And it's okay. not, it's not every tree in the parcel that's for sale. It's, you know, it's every tree that's, you know, mature enough and healthy enough right. and so on. But yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure they have good metrics for knowing within a certain amount of area, how many trees are to, to fell and how many to keep, to keep that long-term viability of that forest. Not exactly. Even. Yeah, sure. exactly. I mean, I think it's, I think it's some, it's like two to one, you know, they want to see yeah. a two to one ratio between growth and extraction every year. So. Okay. Okay. So in, in that, that seasoning, it's just essentially, it's a, a slow leaching of tannin, a, a maturation of, of the, the drying of that wood, obviously some, some biotic changes because of, uh, you know, things that are living on, on the staves. Anything else that we should uh, be thinking about during that seasoning period? So yeah, drying is, is, a, is I mean, that's the, the principle, that's the main reason for it. You know, I mean, the wood right. um, has to, it has, it, we can't build a barrel with wood that's uh, got more than about 15% moisture by weight. So, um, and then, yeah, so there's, uh, and then there's all these other um, benefits for the sensory properties of the wood uh, as mm -hmm. well. Um, and people talk about the difference between air drying, which is what we do versus kiln drying. I mean, obviously, you know, there's, there's a way to speed up that process. Uh, so you can take wood and put it into essentially this, that's a building that's been turned into a giant oven and um, you can reduce the drying time down to a matter of like weeks rather than years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to, I, as far as I know, no one has come up with a, a method of kilning that has the, you know, um, the same uh, benefits for the sensory properties of the wood as okay. air drying does. So, okay. Uh, There'd be a lot of money in that if they could, but. Yeah, exactly. And you got to figure somebody's working on that right now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, so um, maybe let's take it from there. So now staves are on a container being shipped over to you in the U S uh, yep. what's next once they get to you. Uh, so once we get to us, uh, first thing that we do is kind of, uh, is to check the hygiene of the wood. Um, you know, uh, we're concerned, um, mainly with uh, like things like TCA, uh, you know, the container can be a vector for, uh, contamination of the wood. So we open the container, we take a, uh, you know, a sniff of the air in there. And if it smells clean and fresh, then we take the, the wood out, we stage it, and then we take a sample. Uh, we use a router to get some shavings from each pallet uh, of staves. And then we, this is one of the benefits of working for a core company is we have all these instruments in house where, you know, we right. can just run it into the lab and uh, they'll tell us if it's, you know, uh, good or not. Um, I mean, almost all the time it is. And so it's, it's uh it's not what i would think of as like a real serious uh issue but uh nevertheless it's good to you know to have that uh assurance on yeah. uh, on that thought real quick i know that you know there's been some like with cork they, they don't want to harvest the bark from the foot of the tree is there any sort of part of the tree where their issues are more common um can you, do you remove the foot like in with cork mm, no i mean as far as you know, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's all usable. I mean, I, I, there are differences. Like, you know, people talk about, you know, there being a higher concentration of tannin at the base of a tree than there is at the, at the top of the tree, for example. But in terms oh, of anything related, yeah. Um, but in terms of anything related to, you know, like the hygiene of the wood, yeah, there, we don't take any, there's no, you know, special, okay. yeah, uh, okay. steps taken. Um, and then, so then the next thing we have to sort of, sort of check is the moisture content. Um, so, uh, most of the time the wood arrives between 15 and 20% moisture. So we've got to drop it below 15%. So we have a small, and I mean, this is a standard, uh, procedure to just kind of fine tune the moisture content after the air drying. Um, so it would typically spends about a week uh, getting dried. 
and then uh, then it's ready to 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 be processed uh, for for barrel construction. Um, okay, let me so. see if I can pull up a photo of the. Uh, I got some barrel stuff here, but uh, okay. Uh, real quick, see if I can go back on this photo. Oh, it's not letting me. Here we go. Okay, so we have. Um, when you receive the staves, it's pretty flat, right? There's no hollow sort of right. cur curvature mm -hmm. like we're seeing on this left stave mm -hmm. in, the, in the photo we're looking at. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we, we receive uh, we call what we call blank staves. They're, all the surfaces are flat. It's all you know, right angles and, and flat surfaces. Um, and so the processing of the wood is referred to as uh, planing and jointing. Um, and that's the... The, the, how you move from that, a, a straight board into something you know that looks like these uh, sort of tapered uh, staves in the in the picture. So every stave um, has to have the the broad faces planed. Um, the the outside surface of the stave is we call it backing, where we uh, create a, a a curvature. And then the inside face is hollowed um, to that same kind of curved profile. And then the edges of each stave are tapered at the ends. And we have to change the angle from 90 degrees to a more acute angle. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the width of the stave, you know, that the angle is more or less specific to the width of the stave. So in other words, like wider staves have to have a sharper angle. Whereas sure. the narrower staves can remain a little bit straighter, so. Um, and perhaps we should we should mention here that staves are all different uh, widths here. I mean, they're the parameters that you can't go outside of, but not right. every stave is a uniform form width. Anyone that's looking Correct. at barrel can, can tell that. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, you know, with 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 um, with French oak, you know, yeah, it's it, there. There can be staves as as narrow as maybe two and a half, three inches, and some staves are, you know, six inches. And in particular with American oak, because it's quarter sawn, you know, th then the, the, the difference in the widths is even more, like, dramatic. But, um, yeah, no, that's exactly right. There's, uh, there's no uniformity to it. But I imagine, imagine, you know, you have to ultimately arrive at a barrel that within pretty tight tolerances of, of size. How do you take all these varying uh, these staves of varying sizes and, and arrive at a barrel that's you know a pretty tight tolerance of your, your specification mm -hmm. well i mean uh a lot of it depends on the accuracy of the jointing yeah so um if uh if the angles are off you know then that's uh that's a big problem but um <laughs> what we do after we we sort of when we plane and joint a batch of staves then the first step to building the barrel is to lay the staves on a table that's kind of a template for the barrel itself. So um, the length of the table is adjustable. Might have a photo of this. Oh, cool. See if I can find this. There, is that it? So yeah, 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 there you go. That's Danella, yeah, perfect. So uh, yeah, so Salvador's, um, he, he's just finished filling in the space on the table with planed and jointed staves. And he did a couple things uh, uh, there. He checked the staves, you know, for things like knots and cracks. But he also uh, tried to follow a pattern of kind of basically alternating widths so that uh, uh, we're sort of balancing the composition of the barrel. Um, mm -hmm. If if we don't pay attention to it, and we, and we wind up with a barrel that's made up half of wide staves and the other half is narrow staves, the shape of the barrel when we bend it is going to be distorted um, because the the narrow staves all in a row will bow, whereas the the wide staves will stay a little bit flatter. So okay, um, and then but then to answer your question, so like the 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 length of the table equals the circumference of the barrel in the center. So right. uh, the, 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 the way that the last piece he puts on the table fits, he slides it into place, that's really what determines how, you know, uh, how the 
the barrel is going to hold up. So if okay. it, obviously if it's too loose, that's a problem. Uh, too tight is a problem. It has to be has to fit just right. So okay. So what's the word for this uh, first step of uh, assembling here? So you have layout, which is the placing the staves on the table. And then you have raising, which is transferring the staves inside uh, the hoops um, to, 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 to start the barrel assembly. Uh, and it's one of my favorite things to do is to take people on, on tours of, of Cooperages because it's only then I think can you really appreciate the skill of these, uh, these, these people you know, raising the, the barrels, every step of, of anything that you can see where humans are, are working with the barrels is really kind of, uh, it, it's fun to see. Obviously there's fire, so that makes it awesome. But um, you get to understand even a little bit, even though you don't understand all the things these guys are, are taking into consideration that like, you know, they're, they're making all sorts of decisions with every single barrel to try and uh, to, you know, make it fit and sound um, and, you know, structurally, Okay, but also, you know, we'll move on a little bit to uh, uh, other things like uh, cutting and toasting. So, should we go there next? Let's see. All right. Uh oh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So uh, this is, great. Uh, so, yeah. Think, yeah. This is, I think, a picture I took at Demto. So, I often take when my, uh, Group, my deep wine making group comes to town. We try to go to a, a Cooper each year and I switch around. But I think this is the uh, Demtos where they're, they've just finished, oh, okay. where they are finished great. raising the barrels and putting on the, the working hoops. Yep, great, yep, looks good. Um, so, right, so these guys have just kind of finished what the, the guy in the previous picture was starting. Um, and they've got these, as you said correctly, the working hoops. Um, you can also, this is a good picture too, because you can see this uh, pattern that I mentioned pretty clearly of the, the wide staves flanked oh, by right. the narrow ones. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so he's tightening these heavy kind of rigid reusable uh, working hoops on the barrel. And um, the next step will be to uh, bend the barrel into shape. You're gonna want to uh, close up that flared uh, bottom on the barrel. So one thing that doesn't come through in the, this, this photo is the noise. So at this uh, point in the cooperage, with those hammers, you can see the one guy swinging a hammer, uh, but you have guys all around hammering. It is loud. It is yeah. real loud. It is. It's uh, one, one of the hardest enough. tour jobs that uh, I've seen is giving, giving <laughs> a tour through a working cooperage. <laughs> yeah. No, I have uh, lost my voice so many times at the end of uh, Cooperage tours. I can't tell you. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. funny. My, my, my dad is like uh, really lost significant amount of his hearing over the years for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I do my best yeah. to wear ear, ear plugs and everything, but yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have pictures of every step of the process here, but you, uh, after this, they're going to have to, uh, uh, I fix a chain to the bottom of the, the barrel where it's sort of splayed out to be able to, to pull the other head, uh, the head that's on the floor there together, correct? Right, correct. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, the traditional way of doing that is, yeah, to wrap a chain or a cable around the bottom of the barrel and uh, one end of the cable is uh, kind of anchored in place and then the other one is attached to a winch and the winch will draw the, cable tight uh you know the cable's been looped around the um the barrel and uh so you're it's like sort of like lassoing the barrel uh to to uh right. to bend it but usually yeah so the barrel goes on uh a fire to heat the wood and we also spray water around the outside of the barrel at the same time and both of these things are done to try to soften the wood fiber to make it uh flexible enough to bend so usually about 25 minutes or so of heating and then uh wetting and then uh then the barrel's ready to bend okay so really in this photo here maybe with a low fire this might not be toasting but but really warming uh this is, this preparing? actually is to this is toasting yeah this is just oh, okay. a, like a sort of a low long low toast probably i think that previous photo with the, the bright fires unfortunately the fire is so bright yeah so that's warming um oh okay so, uh, oh, right, because the uh, yeah hasn't been shaped into the barrel. I see. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
yeah, we've got usually like a line of barrels being warmed and then we'll, when it's time, they'll pull one off and, and put it in the machine to, to bend it and then it moves on to the toasting fire. And, and what's the, uh, what are you, are you burning oak chips here to, for the fire? Yeah, it's, uh, it's either the scrap that the machines generate with all the planing and, and so on. Uh, anything, any piece of wood that we cut off, you know, to make a barrel oak stave or a barrel head is firewood. And then uh, to supplement that, we buy seasoned oak uh, that's, you know, uh, that uh, can't be made into staves to burn okay. as firewood. So, yeah, uh, but it's always oak. It's always oak. Okay, so we should talk a little bit about uh, uh, toasting here because this is, this is real skill. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, the toasting, you know, there's, uh, there, ha there are, you know, advancements that have been made to this process where people use some other heat source, you know, um, you, you can use convection heat, you can use you know, some kind of infrared heat source, but, you know, I think still most cooperages do it the same way we do, which is to use this coke fueled fire. Um, the fire burns inside a metal, perforated metal pot, like a cylindrical pot on the floor called a brasero. Um, and uh, so, yeah, because you're just kind of continuously feeding this fire, it's, yeah, there's a lot of skill involved in controlling it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You have to know, like, exactly the right time to add a piece of fire, uh, firewood. You have to kind of know how different pieces of firewood are going to burn differently to, based on their size and shape, for example. Like, you know, I just want to kick the fire up a little bit, so I'm going to use this smaller piece versus, you know, uh, I, I need to get the fire going, um, so I'm going to put this larger piece in. Uh, you need to uh, be sort of continuously handling the barrel, you know, to prevent it from getting scorched. Um, so you're, you're spinning the barrel around the fire, you're flipping it over from end to end. Um, and yeah, so for example, this, in, in our cooperage, uh, this is a job that you have to sort of graduate to. You know, you have to really okay. prove yourself um, before we, we will hand you this kind of responsibility. So the, mm -hmm. the guy that does most of the toasting in our cooperage is like the most senior member of the, of the staff. So, yeah. And I still... imagine that for, for the sake of organization, when uh, you, you're doing a, a group of barrels, it would probably all be the same toast in that, that batch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's one of the big challenges of, yeah, organizing production is uh, trying to create these, continuous runs, you know, of as many barrels of the same type as possible. Um, so, uh, you know, there's so much customization, you know, that people are interested in nowadays, you know, people want to try you know, all these different combinations of time and temperature and so on for the toast, which is great, you know, but, um, you know, we basically have like a cookbook in the toasting room and each page in the cookbook essentially has a different recipe for a different type of toast and this thing has grown over the years now where it's like probably three inches thick um so <laughs> yeah that's another challenge is uh is keeping track of all these different toasts that are that are going on but yeah we, I try, mean, to, we try to organize it, as much as we can it's probably a bell curve where the majority of barrels are, are medium toast or yeah medium plus? Okay. yeah that's true yeah medium medium plus uh you know we we've had a lot of success I kind of took one of the one of my sort of uh, favorite experiences of working for Treasury was the fact that there were a few winemakers who really took advantage of having their own in-house cooperage, you know, and spent a lot of time in there with us and um, worked a lot on developing these kind of tailored toasts for their wines. And I learned a lot about toasting through that experience, and I took some of the, you know, some of those lessons uh, to Tunnel Rio. And uh, we ended up, we've had a lot of success with kind of these longer, lower temperature toasts. Um, so we're moving away more, more and more people are trying what we call these slow toasts. And, um, you know, they're moving away from the standard, like medium and medium plus to the slow versions of those toasts. Um, but yeah, I would say there's probably half a dozen toasts or something that make up the core of the production. Okay. So. Right, yes. right. And uh, real quick, I just want to, I'm going to go back to this one slide, and this is not what is happening yeah. with wine barrels. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. folks that are listening to this picture of 
giant fires inside of the barrel which are being charred for for whiskey production or bourbon production exactly right yeah we make a few of those every year but uh yeah that's strictly um that would be a, a barrel for spirits yep yep right so when yeah when people talk about uh you know the charring of the barrels that's that's just never a thing for wine that's really mm -hmm. for, for other spirits mm -hmm. No, with the small yeah, exception exactly. of the people now that are are doing some of the whiskey barrel flavor things, like Robert yes, moved big yep. into that. I know. Yep, exactly the bourbon barrel or whatever they call it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, okay. So after toasting, where do we go next? Where does the so barrel go next? Right. So after toasting, I've got um, this one. Oh, that's cool. So he's uh, so the the there's different ways of organizing the production, but. Uh, what you're seeing in this picture is they've drilled the hole in the, the bung hole in the barrel. And then uh, it looks like that's what's going on. Yeah, he's yeah, I think cauterizing, he, he... Yeah, he's cauterizing the, the hole. So you, you have a, a hot iron that um, has a tapered kind of uh, tip on the end. And uh, you, know, you heat it red hot and you sort of plunge the iron into the hole. and it, as I said, it cauterizes the cut. So if there's any like little cracks or very often like the surface is, is rough, it'll smooth it out and seal it. And it also enhances the, the tapered shape of the hole. Um, oh, okay. To, yeah, so, um, but yeah, so there's the, you, you cut the hole and then you've got to cut the ends of the barrel to prepare it to, so we can insert the heads. Uh, so you basically create two features in the end of both ends of the barrel there. Uh, the, that chamfered end, the, the point, is called the chime. And then just below the chime, the machine carves out a narrow little groove or channel called the crows. And when we build a barrel head, we taper the edge of the head, we bevel it, and the pointed edge of the head slides into the, the, that, into the crows. And it's sort of seated in the barrel uh, that way. And then we, uh, we put a little bit and, of- And uh, Quinn, real quick on, on toasting, the, the barrel heads are generally not toasted, correct? For French oak, that's correct. Yeah, I would say probably right. in our case, more than 80% of the French oak barrels that we make uh, uh, have untoasted heads. With uh, American oak, it's, the, it's almost 100%. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, people are really, looking for a lot of oak impact when they choose or you know more oak impact let's say uh with american oak so so they want to get a, a big bigger bang for the buck yeah so with, with standard french oak are, are the heads not toasted because that untoasted oak lends different flavors and, and maybe different astringency properties to the wine as so you get more of a, a compelling um spice package to the wine what's the what's the reason yeah it's interesting that's a good question i think you know my understanding of the the way that this has all progressed you know through kind of history is that barrel toasting is largely you know like a new world winemaking innovation really so yeah so it was people like say robert mandavi or some of these other california kind of pioneer winemakers who who started encouraging these French coopers to, to sort of quote unquote cook the barrels a little bit more. Um, and I remember my dad told me a story, uh, you know, when he first started working for Philippe Demptos that he, you know, asked him about this and, uh, you know, what about toasting your barrels? And, and Philippe said, I'm, I'm a cooper, I'm not a, I'm not a baker. So, you know, I think that, you know, because you do have to heat the wood, obviously, to bend it. And then you have yeah. to heat it a second time because uh, you have to dry the wood to relieve the tension in it after it's been bent. Like if you bend a barrel and you immediately remove the hoops, the, the staves won't stay bent. They'll spring back. Oh. Uh, they won't be completely straight, but they, they won't be, you know, curved anymore. So the barrels, have, it's always been a two-stage process of heating. Um, mm -hmm. The first was to facilitate the bending, and then the second was to relieve the tension and basically like set the shape of the barrel. 
Okay. But this whole, but the whole thing about extending that heating to modify, you know, the sensory properties of the wood is something that, uh, that uh, didn't really exist in France until they started selling barrels in California. So you have California winemakers really, I think, to thank with all the, you know, all wow. this, yeah, this uh, customization of the barrel. But so that's why I think, you know, it just, it never caught on because barrels weren't really toasted to begin with for a long time. You know, um, you may have had a really light toast on the barrel because it had to be heated, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise they weren't thinking about you know, like, you know, um, aggressively or, uh, you know, toasting, cooking the wood, them, right? toasting the wood. Yeah. So wow. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, head gets put on, I'm sort of, Glossing through it really quick because it's a yeah, very sure. technical process for, for, for that. Yeah. Um, but uh, then, I mean, you have to put on the finishing hoops, take off the working hoops. Correct. Yeah. So that's a very busy workstation. After the barrel, you know, they, they, they prepare the barrel for the heads. The, the guy who puts the heads in the barrels has to change the, the working hoops for the finished, the galvanized uh, sort of strips. Um, and so he's the one who basically puts kind of in a way puts the barrel together so what you mm -hmm. know when it moves from his workstation it looks like a it looks like a barrel and then um uh the hoops will get kind of tightened down by a machine and then tested for leaks so there's a kind of a standard test that coopers do uh, by adding a few gallons of water and then kind of agitating the barrel you flip it from end to end and you roll it and rock it back and forth you're trying to coat the inside of the barrel with a film of water and then mm -hmm. you pressurize it you put a special bung in the barrel that has a schrader valve and you uh it's like pumping up a bicycle tire um pressurize it and the idea is that that air pressure is going to push the water through any weak spots in the in the barrel in the wood or in the barrel itself so um with french oak you know there's that testing is there's a little more rework involved because of the porosity of the wood. Right. Um, and with American Oak, you know, the barrels just kind of fly through basically. Um, and then really at that point, the barrel from, you know, just from the Cooper's point of view, the barrel's kind of finished. If you know, it, we know we built it and we know it doesn't leak, but uh, we're going to want to put our brand on it. And then of course, you know, um, we're going to clean it up by sanding it. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of work that goes into this whole sort of cosmetic finishing of the barrel these days where, you know, the barrel goes into a special machine. It goes onto a big sort of high powered lathe that spins. We have to remove the, the hoops from the center of the barrel, put it on this lathe, spin it under a, a couple of different sanding belts to clean it up. And then, um, of course, we put our brand on it and, you know, whatever technical information like the toast level that the customer wants. And then more and more, you know, people uh, would like their own logo on the barrel. So um, with the advent of like these engraving lasers, uh, we're able to do that. Uh, and then, and then, yeah, just we'll wrap it up and ship it out. So. And it, you know, it, it never, it's never lost on me that I could sit and watch a person put the head on the barrel, I mean, both heads on, on the barrel, and they do it within, you know, a minute. It's obviously, a lot yeah. of hammering, manipulating the hoops <laughs> to get uh, right. loose enough so they can flip the head in. And then once it's in, they gotta gotta tighten those hoops down so it, it stays sound and it's sealed. But then when you get in the winery and you, as a winemaker, try to take a head on or you know take it off, which isn't the hardest thing, but to get it back on, that's uh, oh yeah. I so rarely do any barrel fermentations because I know how difficult and how high my failure rate is in getting that, that head in and, and having it with a good seal. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very tricky. It's very tricky work. Um, oh, we should again, also mention that. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna, that, that's another one of those jobs that really, I mean, uh, you have to work your way up to and, uh, you know, uh, it's only, yeah, like you can't really call yourself a Cooper until you're at least able to do something like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then also it's pretty traditional to use either a flour paste or uh, some other sort of paste to help in that, that seal the, the head, correct? Yes. Yep. So this 
really traditional uh, method that everybody still, well, most people still use. Uh, yeah, it's just to mix wheat flour and, and paste and we'll throw a little bit of the finest powdery um, sawdust in there to, to change the color of the paste to match the wood so it doesn't stand mm -hmm. out quite as much. Um, and then that mixture, it, it has this kind of tacky consistency and you use a sort of like a, uh, a, a little pointed tool to, to sort of smear it inside the, the crows, to fill the crows with that paste. And that's not only gonna seal the junction between the head and the barrel, but particularly with French oak, you know, proper application of that paste can help um, plug up some of the, the pores in the wood and, and potentially mm -hmm. you know, help uh, seal the pores as well. So. Okay. Um, so we're going a little bit long on time here, but I do want to spend a couple quick minutes and just get your thoughts on, on practical uh, keeping of empty wood in a winery, which is something that, that any winery maker has to do with. And it's sometimes hard to come by good information about after you empty a barrel and you wash it and you've got, you know, a number of months until you're going to fill that barrel again. What, uh, what are some of the things to, to keep in mind for, for keeping a barrel healthy and sound while empty, the used barrel? Uh-oh, we lose you? I'll give you a second to see if this comes back. So in the winery, like right now, it's June. I've emptied my barrels over the last couple months. I'm not going to have wine, the new wine, until, you know, at earliest late September, but more through October and November, I'm gonna have wine to, uh, to fill those barrels again. So I've got sometimes close to six months where I've got to manage those barrels empty. And, you know, I'll, I'll empty them, I'll, I'll dry them, sort of dry in quotation marks because they're not getting completely dry because it's, um, you know, almost, almost a sealed uh, vessel. You only have that opening at the, the bung hole. Um, and I'll burn sulfur. I like sulfur wicks. I don't like SO2 gas. I've been over that in past podcast, um, mainly because I hate working with SO2 gas in a winery. Um, but, you know, I, I've tasted wines that taste funny because I don't think the barrels were handled properly uh, when they were empty. I think sometimes if you get little pools of water in there, especially if you have water and then you're, you're burning sulfur or you have SO2 gas there, it can lead to some real weird, weird flavors when you put the wine in. And um, I'd like to hear from Quinn, if I can get him back on the line here, dropped off for a minute. Um, I'd like to hear from Quinn, what's the, what are some of the things to do to manage those empty barrels? So I may have to pause it here and see if I can get him back. Okay, so thank you for doing this. We're, 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 we're back and we're gonna finish off this podcast. Thanks for doing this, Quinn. Um, Absolutely. Right, right when I left you last, lost you a couple of days ago, we were, we were about to talk about empty barrel care. Um, are there any, anything, like what are the most important things that you believe winemakers should be thinking about in terms of, of taking care of their barrels while they're, they're empty in between vintages to keep them healthy and sound for the next wine? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, having a good, uh, a, a good system in place, for cleaning the barrel, you know, immediately after it's emptied of wine, uh, is is critical. You know, to make sure that when you're when you're cleaning the barrels, that you're actually that you're thoroughly cleaning them. Um, so I know that there are various methods in use, um, but I, I I suppose above all, you know, just be, you know, to um, to be vigilant about you know checking the uh, the, the cleanliness of the barrel um, before you're going to sort of put it away. Um, making sure, for example, you know, paying close attention to the color of the rinse water, uh, making mm -hmm. sure that that's completely clear. Um, uh, you know, giving the barrel uh, a check, even with a flashlight through the bunghole, uh, to see that, you know, that there's no residue, uh, no wine residue left in the barrel. Um, you know, uh, letting the barrel dry thoroughly. I know that this can be a challenge sometimes uh, right. to, to actually leave the barrel for the proper length of time for it to, to completely dry uh, before you I, attempt to uh, sanitize it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that that really depends on sort of your environmental conditions, uh, but um, Correct. 
does that usually take more than, than a day? Is there any sort of um, anything yeah. you can look to check? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. You know, I mean, normally if this is all taking place in a, you know, temperature climate controlled cellar, um, with a, with cool temperature and relatively high humidity, that's going mm -hmm. to slow down the the drying process. Uh, I guess a good rule of thumb is um, well. Another thing too, I think that affects the rate of the drying is the temperature of the water that's being used. Uh, typically, barrels that have been rinsed with hot water will dry out faster than barrels that have been rinsed just strictly with cold water. And um, sure. but uh, you know. I think an hour or two um, is is probably a fairly good rule of thumb, and then you know you can always you know try to do a, a quick check. Um, you know we do in the cooperage after we test a barrel with water before we start the finishing process. We want to make sure that the barrel, the interior of the barrel, is dry, and uh, we'll um, just uh, feel inside the uh, the interior surface around the bunghole. So you can just put uh, your hand in there, and uh, if it's slick to the touch, obviously it uh, it has to wait. Uh, you want to feel a dry surface on the inside uh, before you continue. Um, another thing that uh, you can do without touching is if you take a look at the bunghole. If there's if there's water obviously visible around the bunghole, then it's still it's still it still needs to drain. Um, but uh, that to me as yeah, is. is really critical and, and and maybe sometimes overlooked part of the process that you're you're thoroughly cleaning the barrel and that you're thoroughly drying it uh, before you would attempt to put it away in storage. So. And then um, once it's dry most people are either going to burn some sulfur or introduce uh, uh, sulfur gas, uh, yeah. SO2 gas. Yeah um, I think depending on yeah depending on the number of barrels that you're working with I think you know when I was at Mandavi you know everybody used uh, you know Compressed cylinder, comp compressed gas, SO2 gas. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think like a, a few seconds of SO2 gas at around you know 15 or 20 psi is the equivalent of around half a stick of sulfur. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, I, I I I believe I recall that you know when I was working at Mandavi in the cellar, we used to use that um, that uh, metric where we'd say, okay, three seconds of gas in a dry, clean barrel. And then uh, we would put a paper cup in the bunghole. And then um, uh, I've, you know, you could bung it up tight uh, as well. Um, but uh, that was usually good enough to keep, to keep the barrel for about four weeks um, before we would need to, 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 to either fill it or check it again uh, to see if it needed a new you know, another dose. So. It, is there any, to, to your knowledge, is there any detriment to um, reintroducing like an SO2 gas or reburning sulfur wicks? You know, I, the only thing I have heard, you know, that um, uh, that if, if you overdo it, um, this is maybe one of the reasons why some people choose like a more permeable, um, uh, stopper like uh, instead of a bung is that uh, if if you overdo it and you, the wood actually absorbs some of the sulfur that that can have a detrimental effect uh, on wine after it goes in um, but it's a fine line that you walk for sure you know I mean you yeah. you know um, overdoing it obviously also has potential uh, negative consequences for the seller personnel you know you don't want to be in a position where you open a barrel and get a real heavy hit of that stuff, you know. Um, but at the same time, you know, obviously uh, you want to be vigilant and, uh, and uh, make sure that there's at least, uh, there's at least some presence of SO2 in the barrel while it's empty. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Just, I, I should mention real quick that, you know, SO2 gas is the real deal. It's, uh, it's really toxic. So it's, it's important that if you're using it to use your full PPE, um, I also in the state of California, you have to have a qualified applicator's license to use that that SO2 gas. So okay, it's, uh, yeah, it's a it's a serious deal, and you know it's one of the reasons I don't use it. I'm I'm in a small small winery at CV, so you know mm -hmm. I'm only having 200 barrels per vintage. I just find it uh, I can burn sulfur just fine, and and that SO2 gas, I just that stuff. If you get a little bit of whiff of it, really uh, really knocks me out. It gives me a terrible yeah, headache, and I hate that stuff. I think it's, it's super dangerous. I'm with you. Yeah, totally. It's bad news. Um, 
that was you know I remember actually least... yeah go ahead when I, was Mo- when I was at Mondavi uh years and years ago just as an intern I remember walking by a tank once when they were uh they were putting in making an SO2 addition to wine but back then yeah. I'm sure they don't anymore but back then they used 100% SO2 solution yeah it's like really slick machine to inject so it was great because you had to use very little volume of you know water with the, the yeah. uh, SO2 and um but I remember walking by and like, I just got knocked out. Like it was uh, like, I got hit, just got a little bit of sniff of it. And it was, it was terrible. So. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was about to, to tell kind of a similar anecdote from, from Mandavi days uh, with those Oak upright tanks that uh, mm-hmm. we built in the Tokalon cellar, which are, you know, beautiful. And, and, and obviously uh, they made a lot of great wine in those tanks, but the part of the, the maintenance involved for those was once they were emptied after harvest, you know, you do this rinse and, and then they were just stored empty basically, but we had to get them dosed with SO2 after we cleaned them. And uh, so we had these little metal pots for each tank and we'd put five sticks in there and burn it. And um, it was like, you know, setting off you know setting the timer on a bomb you know uh you'd kind of <laughs> stick the pot in there light it just close the thing as fast as you could just run you know and then um you had to be just so super cautious when you finally went back a few weeks later to open the tank um because yeah you know uh sticking your head inside that thing could be a could be a, <laughs> a, a bad experience so yeah yeah last story uh, i was before i got the stag leap wine cellars but i the, the story was still fresh when I got there. And this was back in like, you know, early 2000s, back when the, the tasting room was still in one of the, the tank rooms and they had some oak uprights. And there was a, one of the cellar workers who was just, just new. It was his job to uh, SO2 gas these uh, oak uprights. Mm-hmm. And it, he was supposed to hit it with 10 seconds. And he misread it as 10 minutes. And they oh had to, uh, yeah, they had to evacuate the whole building, move all the tourists oh. out. Oh, the hazmat crew came in and yeah. right. you just gotta let it breathe for a day at that point i think but yeah. uh okay so yeah. this has been an, an awesome education in in trees oak barrels wood i, I want to give you a chance now to to sort of talk about tunnel rio uh where can people go to check it out and is there anything else you want to mention about the cooperage before we sign off yeah, thanks. Well, thank you uh, for the opportunity. You know, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And um, um, but uh, so yeah, the, the the cooperage. This has been probably my my certainly my best experience working in the cooperage industry, working for Chanel Rio. Um, and exactly, not working with uh, your your dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes family business can be a little can be a little tricky. <laughs> I couldn't but, uh, imagine working with my father, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's true, it's true. But um, so uh, I think that, you know, what we offer here is uh, like a truly kind of, you know, consultative approach to, to making barrels. Um, so I've been able to leverage some of my winemaking experience and, uh, you know, I put some work into uh, educating myself about wine um, in the last uh, 10 years or so. Working at Mandavi was actually, uh, that was one of the most positive things about, about that experience too, was that the Mandavi family in particular was great about uh, educating their employees. I learned a lot about wine working there for sure. And then um, I went on uh, on my own through the Wine and Spirits Education Trust and I, I got the level three certification uh, uh, for that. So I'm trying to combine you know, uh, knowledge of oak and wine to really provide our customers with a unique uh, level of service. So I try to participate in as many, you know, tastings with customers as I can. And uh, I think that the feedback that I get from them, uh, you know, I'm, I can apply toward sort of tailoring a barrel uh, to, to what, they're, what they're looking for for specific wines. And hey, it, can you I know, put you on uh, that a little bit? Is that when, when you say tailoring? Does that mostly apply to seasoning or uh, grain selection? Where does that really come into play? Yeah, yeah, it can. It can be. You know, we look at a few different parameters. Uh, things like um, uh, grain density, for example, uh, fine grain selection versus the sort of standard grain selection, uh, the size of the barrel. Uh, 
you know, as uh, you increase the, the capacity of a barrel, you know, you change the ratio of the volume of wine to the surface area of the wood, and that can affect the extraction uh, of, uh, you know, oak into the wine. Um, toasting is probably the, you know, from, uh, is probably the most significant thing that we can sort of uh, fine tune. Uh, the difference between like a longer, lower temperature toast to kind of preserve some of the tannin in the wood to help, which really I think does, especially with coupled with a fine grain selection, can really help uh, enhance a sense of like energy and freshness in certain wines. Um, uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, you know, if, if people are looking for, um, you know, a real sort of uh, opulent character to say a, a Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, um, lots of like lush texture and then lots of sweetness and length that can be contributed by uh, higher temperature, uh, more intense toasting. Um, all these variables, you know, we can play with, you know, toasted versus untoasted heads, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's fun, you know, for me to actually uh, to, to, to get in there and uh, consult with the customer and then take the feedback back to the cooperage and talk to the guys about, you know, what we can do for them. So can I ask um, you real quick, um, mm -hmm. just give you a little bit of a, a scenario, which I'm sure would be easy for you to answer, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm pitching this project and I'm, I'm looking to make a, a Grenache. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from a warm climate, past Robles. Uh, I want to build it, you know, really fruit forward, uh, really low, low astringency. Um, I'm open to, to size and toast and, and all sorts of recommendations. Uh, I want mm -hmm. it flavor wise to be, you know, fruit first, but I want to have a good, good spice, you know, uh, contribution from the barrel. What, what sort of things come mm -hmm. to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say, uh, you know, we can, uh, we, I would, consider fine grain selection. Um, I, usually the, the, the fine grain uh, contributes a little bit more delicacy in terms of aroma. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's really good at creating or helping, helping to enhance, I should say, a sense of, you know, like fresh fruit rather than that kind of sometimes confectionary fruit uh, mm -hmm. that you can get from from um, from oak, uh, you know, maybe looking at slightly larger format. Uh, one of the things that I really like to talk about is the 265 liter barrel, uh, which is a barrel that um, my dad actually invented uh, at Mendocino Cooperage. Um, and so it's a 70 gallon barrel. Uh, and what we did was we combined the length of a Bordeaux export barrel with the diameter of a Burgundy export barrel. So the barrel holds more wine, uh, but it fits on a standard uh, barrel rack. Um, oh, that's important. Or if you're pyramid, if you're pyramid stacking, it's you know uh, it's easier to 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 to, to integrate. So um, right, yeah. So uh, and then with that extra ten gallons, you know, it tends to be kind of a slightly less impactful for uh, impactful barrel, especially at you know a toast level for what you described. I think. You know, kind of in the on the lighter end of the spectrum. Um, you know, we have a, a toast level called medium slow, uh, where um, we lower the temperature a little bit. We extend the time. Um, you get a little bit of the uh, degradation of tannin that comes from your kind of moderate intensity toasting, um, but uh, you're not high enough into the the temperature range that you know, really brings on the, those furfural base, like that amaretto, you know, Jordan almond, like really kind of confectionary oak characters. It's still fairly natural. Um, so yeah. Um, and what large, about, uh, what about wood provenance? We, I would say what we do for the 265 liter barrel, we are working with two suppliers in the center of France. Um, so there's one that sources wood from the central and the eastern uh, end of the Loire Valley. Uh, and then there's another that's right in the heart of the Department of uh, Nieve. So um, that's a lot of people are more familiar with the name uh, uh, of Nevers. 
Um, so Nev yeah. is the de is the department. Nevers is a city within that department, and there's a forêt domaniale called Bertrange, which is maybe the best known of that department. So they're they're working with uh, Bertrange wood uh, as well as some of the other uh, lesser known forêt domaniale. Um, but uh, Quinn, can can you see this map? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of. Yes. Sorry, um, it's a small photo, but wh where are we talking about? Yeah, here? I'm enlarging it. Yeah, yeah, this is good. So, yeah, so you can see uh, Nevers. So that would be uh, th that would be in our the way we would refer to it here in, at, at Tunnel Road would be Nieve. Um and then just to the north of of Nevers on that map, you, they have the, the village of Sancerre uh, uh, marked off. So. The, the second supplier that I mentioned is just about 30 minutes outside of Sancerre. And so they're sourcing wood. You see the Loire Valley is kind of shaded or outlined there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, um, a lot of really nice forêt domaniale in that part of France. Um, there's no accident that the regions of France where they, you find some of these big, beautiful castles, uh, like Chenonceau and Chambord, for example, there's also these really, really beautiful uh, national forests. Um, uh, you know, these, a lot of these castles were essentially like, um, you know, the French royalty would, would stay there and to, and to, to hunt. <laughs> so oh, these okay. forests were preserved as their hunting grounds originally, but, you know, uh, today they, they're managed by the French government for, you know, the highest quality timber. So okay. that's a really rich, rich area of France for like really high quality oak, um, you know, there's a, a name that, a word that some people may be familiar with, you know, called fute, which is a, a type of forestry management system that they practice pretty extensively in these national forests. So it's basically like cultivating the trees, um, you know, for, to, to maximize the, the quality of the timber. So these are fute forests on, uh, uh, in, that are the property of the French national government. And it's, I mean, it may be the, the finest quality oak timber that's available anywhere in the world. So. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah. Okay, and then if yeah. uh, what are your thoughts on American oak, uh, given the wine that I described, uh, that Grenache? Yeah, yeah. So I would say uh, for American oak, uh, I think maybe my favorite source of American oak is Minnesota, um, and this is something uh, that my family also I kind of played a role in, which is um, there's a, a stave mill in the southeastern corner of Minnesota, uh, and uh, I think I meant to mention this earlier, but my my dad was kind of instrumental in uh, getting these guys to switch from bourbon stave to wine stave production back in the early 90s. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's probably due to the kind of severity of the winters in that part of the country. Um, shorter growing season, uh, it tends to slow down the growth of the white oaks in that part of the country. And so the grain in that wood is comparatively... Uh, finer than a lot of the the grain that you find from say places like Missouri. Um, uh, so it's pretty fine grained wood. I think too, and I, I'm really interested in testing this kind of idea, is that seasoning wood in a place that goes through a really deep freeze every year is significant, you know, because that doesn't really occur in France. You know, you have this maritime climate and they get a little bit of snow in most of our, you know, our mills in France, but uh, it's nothing like, you know, 20 below or, or you know, what, what, they, what they get in Minnesota. So my sense is that, you know, the slower growth and then this really severe uh, weather during seasoning really makes that wood, it gives it a kind of uniquely elegant uh, kind of uh, sensory profile. Uh, and sometimes, honestly, like sometimes tasting blind, it's pretty difficult to pick that wood out as American oak. Um, wow. because it, That's yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. It'll have, you know, kind of a, a brown spice character at like, you know, medium plus toast. Um, but very little, uh, of that kind of classic lactone, you know, coconut tropical, uh, sweetness to it. Um, so it's much more kind of like restrained and, and, and elegant. Um, so I would choose that. And, um, you know, uh, probably go for, again, like a medium, slow, kind of a moderate uh, toast. It's not something I might recommend with 
American Oak from other sources, but with this, starting with this kind of more uh, elegant uh, oak, I think that, uh, you know, it would be a nice kind of subtle uh, contribution to the wine. Okay, thank you. So I've got two questions for you. Uh, yeah. First, can you just, do you, does the client go and say, I've heard about this uh, wood from Minnesota, I want the, the Minnesota wood? What, what's the nomenclature on that? Sourcing. Yeah. So right. So what we we um, we sell a, a two-year seasoned uh, Minnesota barrel that we call Northern Blend, mm -hmm. and then we have a uh, a three-year seasoned uh, Minnesota barrel that we refer to as Minnesota. We actually um, the three-year stuff comes exclusively from this one mill, and so we refer to our three-year seasoned American oak as as a single mill selection. Uh, so the name of this family that's been running this mill uh, uh, since the 60s is Stagemeyer. Um, so it's the Stagemeyer uh, Minnesota barrel. But uh, we're going to have a four, I believe actually we do have a four-year option available. And then we will have a five-year season American Oak barrel. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that, uh, how that turns out. But that, that'll be, I think, either in 21 or 22. Two, I believe 2022 will have that five-year option. Okay, and what is the uh, what's the upshot of going past two years in seasoning for American oak? Yeah, so uh, the idea is that by extending the seasoning, you know, you are um, you are cre helping to create a more elegant sensory profile in the wood. Um, you know, that the idea is by leaving it out. You know, for example, it's going to be rinsed. Uh, it's going to get a better, more thorough rinse by rain. Uh, so, you know, that should help uh, leach some more tannins from the wood. And then all these other processes that we talked about earlier, of, you know, the, um, the effect of the, all the microbial growth on the wood, uh, you know, is probably going to be enhanced at, at longer seasoning. The, the trade-off is that the longer the wood stays outside, you know, because, again, we're not intervening at all. We're, we're you know, this is completely um you know sort of natural open air drying the longer the wood is exposed to the elements um the more damage occurs you know so sure. uh you can get more cracks more warping so we have to get rid of more wood the longer we season it but what we are able to use you know should be um sh should be you know should be really great Oh. All right, great. And then what's yeah. the name of that uh, that larger size barrel, the 70 gallon barrel you were just telling us about? We just call it a 265 liter barrel. Um, okay. Yeah, so. All right, well, thank you. That's uh, uh, on a very uh, selfish level, that's super helpful. But um, okay, okay. You, you were talking about Tenlery Oak. Tell me the, the website, please, and I, which I will also link to in the, the show notes and I'll have it as part of this YouTube clip in the, the comments as well. Great. Yeah. So it's www.tenellerio.com. Um, there's uh, Go ahead and spell Tenellery because I can Yeah. <laughs> this is a tricky one. Uh, it's T-O-N-N-E-L-L-E-R-I-E-O -E -E uh, with no space or uh, underscore or anything. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of great information on the website about the sourcing of our wood. We also go into pretty good detail about uh, a, a really interesting program that we offer. Um, it's called the Master Cooper program that we've been um, that we've been doing for a few years now, um, uh, where we, we offer winemakers the opportunity to uh, come to France with us and visit suppliers, uh, see their stave mill operations uh, from start to finish. Um, we go in the first three months of each year so that we're able to also uh, watch uh, trees being felled in the forest. Um, and it's a pretty unique opportunity to, you know, to learn, um, you know, at the source. Um, our suppliers are great about sharing information and being completely transparent about how they operate. And you can see everything, you know, you can, uh, they'll show you, you know, for example, how they trace the origin of all of the staves they make um, back to the specific parcel of forest where the trees were growing. Um, you know, we, we, we encourage people to participate over multiple years because uh, the supplier will reserve 
uh, wood specifically the, for the production of their barrels. Mm -hmm. And they offer kind of a menu of different forests uh, that, uh, that the customer can choose from. Uh, so it's also a, an interest, a, kind of an opportunity to explore this idea that everybody's heard a lot of sort of talk about over year, the years about the, the idea that, you know, the concept of terroir extending to oak. In other words, you know, it's an opportunity for people to buy uh, barrels from these specific forests for comparison. And that's the way a lot of people, people who are participating have chosen to, um, to use it. So they'll, um, they'll split their order up over a couple forests or more and, um, you know, sort of uh, track the, 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 the wine uh, in, in these different forests. And uh, it's fascinating uh, to, to, to taste uh, the results. So. You know, Quinn, we didn't talk much about your oak alternative uh, businesses, but can people find information on the website? Yes, there's information. Uh, uh, the Alternatives Division has its own website. Uh, the, the name of the brand is Creative Oak. So it's creativeoak.com. Um, and uh, there's lots of great information uh, there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we have um, French and American uh, alternatives available either fire toasted or um, convection toast. And again, you know, uh, we're trying to, to take a really consultative approach to, um, to, to, to working with the customer. And um, so we are seeing more and more requests for things like blends of different toasts. Um, so we can blend, you know, percentages of convection toasted uh, wood with percentages of fire toasted wood. You know, the, the, there's a really almost endless, you know, uh, combination of, uh, of things that, that, uh, that you can do. Uh, and so we're building, again, a little bit like the way we're trying to customize barrels for customers, we can customize people's alternative, um, you know, uh, recipes as well. All right, great. Is there anything else we need to talk about before we sign off? Uh, I think, uh, I think, we, I think that about, about covers it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks well, so thank you so much. I've, I've learned a ton. This has been fun. So I really appreciate your time. Good. Great. Fun for me too. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Right. Okay. Bye-bye.